Hello everyone. Today we'll be continuing our conversation about thermal physics. We'll pick up where we left off last time by talking about these two totally different terms that are often confused with one another, even though they mean different things. The first word is heat. Heat doesn't necessarily mean that something is hot, meaning at a high temperature. Instead, in physics, the technical term for heat is a form of energy which is transferred from hot objects into cold objects. Since heat is a form of energy, we measure it in units of joules. The other word is temperature. Temperature does actually mean how hot or cold something is. But what does it mean and how is it different from heat? Temperature is the amount of vibration of the molecules of a substance. This vibration can be measured using all kinds of temperature scales, such as degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, or Kelvin. We'll discuss all three of these in this video. We'll start by talking about something that's hot that people interact with all the time, coffee. Hot coffee is usually served at a temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But what does 180 degrees Fahrenheit mean? What is that a measurement of? Well again, it's a measurement of the amount of vibration of the molecules of the coffee. Now if this coffee is left out in a cold room, then as time goes on, it's going to get colder. How does it get colder? It gets colder by letting heat out into the environment. When the heat flows out, the coffee will become colder. You can see in the animation that the particles are not moving as much. The rate of vibration is lower, so the temperature is a lower measurement. You'll notice here that heat is what's flowing in or out of the substance. You wouldn't say that a substance has heat. Instead, you talk about a substance giving away heat or receiving heat from the environment. On the other hand, temperature is a state of being. A substance can have a temperature, but it can't have heat because heat is what it gives or receives. So that's the difference between the two words. Now, it should be obvious why we study things like heat and temperature, because something like water can behave very differently if it's at a high temperature versus a low temperature. So we're going to talk about water molecules for a second. You probably know that H2O is the chemical formula for water, and that H2 refers to the fact that there are two hydrogen atoms bonded to a single O for oxygen. The diagram you're seeing here is how water molecules are usually represented, but we're going to look at a lot of them in the next couple diagrams. So just to simplify it, I'm going to represent a water molecule like this, just a little blue circle. Here's how water molecules are arranged when they're in the solid state. The particles are all very close together, and they're only vibrating a little bit because their temperature is very low. One thing you probably already know about solids is that they have a constant volume and a constant shape. So that's a property of solids to keep in mind. Now, this probably isn't news to you, but if you add heat to a solid, that will cause its temperature to rise until it melts and becomes a liquid. Do you know what temperature this phase change occurs at? It depends on the scale you're using. If you're using Fahrenheit, then this happens at 32 degrees. But if you're using Celsius, then it happens at 0 degrees. More on that later. Notice that the liquid's molecules have more energy. The additional energy that they gained allows them to smoothly glide around, so they have a constant volume, but not a constant shape. Adding heat to a liquid will cause its temperature to rise until it boils and becomes a gas. Again, probably not new information for you. Do you know the temperature at which this phase change occurs for water? Again, it depends on the scale you're using. In Fahrenheit, it's 212 degrees, but in Celsius, it's 100 degrees. Looking at these two temperature scales, it should be obvious which one scientists prefer. Gases, unlike solids and liquids, do not have a constant volume or a constant shape, so they can expand infinitely to fill whatever container they're inside of. The last note here is that if you add heat to a gas, it will cause its temperature to rise again until it ionizes and becomes a plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter where individual molecules are so energetic that they rip themselves to pieces and form a soup of positively charged particles and negatively charged particles. This is very cool, but pretty advanced and not the kind of thing you need to understand in our class. So you can feel free to Google it. All right, so we mentioned that there are a couple different ways to talk about temperature. Let's talk about the Fahrenheit scale, which at one point was the most commonly used temperature scale across the world. This temperature scale was invented by Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit, born in the 1700s. The scale was originally based on a few important values, which Fahrenheit measured himself. 
His estimate for the human body temperature was about 96 degrees, which is a little bit off from what we know it to be today, but it was a fairly accurate guess for his time. 32 degrees he marked as the temperature of melting ice, and zero degrees, he said, was the temperature of a brine solution that he had made in his laboratory, which is like a mixture of ice, salt, and water. These three temperatures formed the increments of the Fahrenheit scale. Now, if it's not immediately obvious, the reason this scale isn't used as commonly anymore across the world is because it's based on three separate things. The human body, ice, and brine, which again is like ice and salt water put together. So there's no one thing that this scale is based on. Across the world, there are very few countries that use Fahrenheit as their official scale for temperature anymore. In fact, the United States is the only highly developed nation that still uses it. The rest of the world uses a scale called Celsius, which we'll talk about next. The Celsius scale was originally called centigrade, but it was renamed in honor of the astronomer Anders Celsius, who had proposed a similar scale to what we use today. Celsius is based on the following values. 100 degrees Celsius is defined as the temperature at which liquid water will boil, and 0 degrees Celsius is defined as the temperature at which liquid water will freeze. Most humans around the world, and all scientists, including those in the United States, use Celsius as their primary scale for determining temperature. The reason is, 0 and 100 are numbers that are very easy for humans to understand, and it makes for nice even increments. So scientists love it, and people around the world love it too. As of the making of this video, the United States has not yet got on board with Celsius, but once they do, the whole world will be on the same page. That'll be really nice and convenient for everybody. Now I know that change is scary, and if you already understand Fahrenheit and Celsius is new to you, you might be hesitant to switch over your way of thinking about temperature. And I wouldn't blame you. Change can be scary. But let's talk about how Celsius and Fahrenheit compare. Celsius and Fahrenheit are like two different languages that describe the same thing, which is temperature. Over on the right we can see two thermometers, which are actually at the same level, so they're describing the same temperature. The only difference is where we slap the numbers on the actual thermometer itself. One key difference between the two is that Celsius has larger degrees than Fahrenheit. To be specific, one degree Celsius is equal to nine-fifths of a degree Fahrenheit. That's nearly double. So one Celsius is almost like two Fahrenheits. Here are some advantages of using Celsius instead of Fahrenheit in your everyday life. It's a simpler scale. Numbers going from zero to 100 are pretty pleasing to humans because we have 10 fingers and 10 times 10 is 100. So it just comes naturally to us to count by factors of 10. The other advantage is that Celsius is more universal and easier to replicate than Fahrenheit, since it's only based on water. There is, however, one advantage that Fahrenheit has over Celsius. It provides a more satisfying scale for making weather forecasts. Here's an image pulled off the internet which demonstrates this. If you go outside and it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, it's really cold, so you should probably wear a winter jacket. But if it's 100 degrees outside, then it's really hot and you'll probably wear shorts and a t-shirt. Whereas if you're in Celsius, zero degrees means it's kind of chilly, and 100 degrees outside means you're going to die because it's boiling outside. So Fahrenheit works a little bit better when you're talking about weather specifically. Now, both Celsius and Fahrenheit have a big problem, and that is that zero degrees should mean that a substance has no temperature because degrees are what temperature is measured in. So having zero of it should mean you don't have any temperature. But in both scales, Zero is not the bottom. You can have negative 10 degrees, negative 20 degrees, and it keeps on going to bigger and bigger negative numbers the colder you get. This is a problem because you're going to run into situations where people misunderstand how hot or cold things are. For example, is 100 degrees twice as hot as 50 degrees? In both of these scales, the answer is no. 100 is not double 50. It should be but in these scales it's not, because zero is not the bottom. You can go lower. So let's go a little deeper into this. If zero isn't the lowest temperature, then what is? Here we have a diagram of a thermometer that's been stuck into the molecules of a substance. And as the substance heats up and expands and the molecules are vibrating more, we see that the temperature is rising. If we go in reverse though, and we make the substance colder and colder and colder, we should eventually get to a temperature where the molecules are not vibrating at all. So what is the lowest possible temperature that can exist in our universe when matter would completely stop moving? We have a name for this temperature, and it's called absolute zero, 
which is a really cool name that means the absolute bottom, the least minimum temperature that you can possibly have, where nothing is going on on a molecular level at all. Well, I have good news for you. Through experimentation, scientists have already discovered that absolute zero is found at approximately negative 273 degrees Celsius. So there you go. That's the coldest temperature possible in our universe. You should feel free to Google the term absolute zero to figure out how this was determined. It's pretty interesting. Now, absolute zero is such an important concept in physics that it earned its own third temperature scale, which is called Kelvin. In this temperature scale, absolute zero is truly zero. So let's talk about the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale was named in honor of Lord Kelvin, that's a cool title, who was the first person to accurately calculate the value of absolute zero. I'll note there that sometimes we add the decimal 0.15 onto it, that's a little bit more precise, but sometimes you only need to use whole numbers, like in this class. The Kelvin scale is based on absolute zero being called zero Kelvin, so there's no negative numbers here. It's either zero or it's a positive number. All physicists and chemists use the Kelvin scale, along with Celsius, to measure the temperature of substances. Kelvin is the official temperature scale for the metric system, although, again, Celsius is accepted as well. It's really easy to convert between Celsius and Kelvin. The size of a degree Celsius is exactly the same as the size of a Kelvin. On that note, Kelvin is the only temperature scale that does not use the word degrees. You only need to say Kelvin. Finally, here's what makes Kelvin really useful for scientists. It's the only scale in which you can accurately compare temperatures. For example, 200 Kelvin is a temperature that is truly twice as hot as 100 Kelvin. This is not true in the scales of Celsius and Fahrenheit because in those scales, zero is not the least amount you can have. In Kelvin, however, zero is the bottom, so that means 200 is double the amount of 100. So if you want to compare one thing being twice as hot as something else, you can only make that kind of comparison if you're measuring in Kelvin. Over on the right, you can see the three most common temperatures that you would have to know in the Kelvin scale. Absolute zero, unsurprisingly, is zero Kelvin. The freezing point of water is 273 Kelvin, and the boiling point of water is 373 Kelvin. These match up with some Celsius temperatures, and you can see that the difference between the two is the number 273. So that's gonna be a conversion that we do in a moment. So let's summarize by looking at all three temperature scales so that we can compare them. On the left, we have Fahrenheit, which is a 180 degree scale between water's freezing point and boiling point. Then next door, we have Celsius, which is a 100 degree scale between water's freezing point and water's boiling point. And then the Kelvin scale on the right also has 100 increments between these two temperatures. It's easy to convert between Celsius and Kelvin because as you can see, all the numbers are different by exactly 273. Fahrenheit, on the other hand, is way different, and so you actually need a real formula to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. In our class, we'll hardly ever do that because Celsius and Kelvin are just more useful. One thing that would be smart to do is to memorize the temperatures that I've labeled here. If you can remember that water's freezing point is either 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, and if you can remember that water's boiling point is 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, and lastly, if you can memorize that absolute zero is either zero Kelvin or negative 273 degrees Celsius, then you can solve pretty much any problem that involves converting between temperature scales. Everything else can come afterwards with a formula. So we'll end with the conversion formula between Celsius and Kelvin. We won't be using Fahrenheit in our class because as we discussed, scientists around the world don't use it. And we're in a science class, so we won't either. If you wanna calculate how much temperature something has in units of Kelvin, then all you need to do is take the Celsius temperature and add the number 273. If you wanna go in the opposite direction and calculate what the temperature of something is in degrees Celsius, then take whatever the temperature is in Kelvin and subtract 273. And that's it, that's all there is to it. So let's do some practice with both directions here. We'll do three examples converting into Kelvin. The temperature at which water freezes is zero degrees Celsius. If you add 273, then you've determined that this temperature in Kelvin is 273. It's pretty easy math. What about room temperature, which in Celsius is about 21 degrees? That's about the temperature you're probably feeling right now. Add 273, and you discover that in Kelvin, room temperature is 294 Kelvin. That sounds like a lot, but 294 is actually room temperature. It's pretty comfortable. 
And then what about the temperature at which water boils? You probably know that that's 100 degrees Celsius. Add 273, and you find that water boils at 373 Kelvin. Finally, going in the other direction. What is absolute zero in degrees Celsius? As long as you can memorize that absolute zero is zero Kelvin, then just subtract 273 from that, and you'll get negative 273 Celsius. Here's a random number, 300 Kelvin. What is that in Celsius? Once again, subtract 273, and you'll find that it is 27 degrees, which is like a hot summer day. And lastly, another random number, 100 Kelvin. Subtract 273, and we find that it's negative 173 degrees Celsius. And that's really, really cold. One thing you should notice is that Kelvin is never going to be displayed as a negative number. It can only be zero or a positive value. So if you're doing a temperature conversion and you find that your Kelvin temperature is negative, that means you might have done something in reverse order. So that's something to check for. All right, that was a lot of talk about temperature, but now you should be prepared for all the other things you're gonna do in your unit on thermal physics. Hope you enjoyed, I'll see you in the next video.